Hello and welcome to the TCS webinar on building resilient and agile ecosystems with cloud in the world of travel and hospitality. Thank you so much for joining the session today. Travel and hospitality is one of the world's largest economic sectors, supporting one in 10 jobs and generating over 10% of the global GDP. As we all agree, the impact of the pandemic has not only been economic, but also social. Given the unique nature of the industry, we have brought together these amazing leaders to discuss, share their views, challenges, and how they have harnessed the abundance of cloud to transform their businesses. I am Aditya Nagarajan, Global Head for Strategic Initiatives and Operations at the TCS AWS Business Unit, and I'll be the host for this webinar. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed panel of leaders today. We have Gerard Ensal. Gerard is the Executive Vice President and the Chief Information Officer of the Avis Budget Group. He is responsible for the management of information technology and has been championing various digitization initiatives across all the brands worldwide, like Avis Rent-A-Car, Budget Trucks, Zipcar, and others. Equally excited to introduce Scott Strickland. Scott is Executive Vice President and the Chief Information Officer at the Wyndham Hotels and Resorts. Scott is responsible for all aspects of IT and his goal is to innovate and transform customer experience. TCS has the privilege of working with Gerard, Scott and, his and their teams on various initiatives. Thank you Gerard and Scott for being with us here today. We have our next guest, Jay McBain. Jay is a principal analyst at Forrester and is one of the most visible and respected thought leaders and has spent 27 years of his career in various executive channel sales, marketing, and strategy roles. Please also join me in welcoming Florian Tennis from AWS. Florian brings over 20 years of experience in the world of travel and hospitality, and has a passion for all things travel and technology. Now, at TCS, we believe that the digital transformation-led businesses are likely to play out over three horizons. The first horizon is all about laying the foundation using a combinatorial capability of technologies such as cloud, IoT, agile, edge, and so on. In essence, building the digital foundation, which we call as a digital core. The next horizon is about how we use these digital core to be able to enable transformation of the business processes and the overall innovation of the business model itself. This is also possible by the enterprise collaborating and exchanging best practices and capabilities with peer enterprises across industries. The third order of transformation, which is what we call as the uh, higher order transformation is about transforming and growing on purpose-led ecosystems, which is where the enterprise truly is able to generate exponential value by not only transforming itself, but is able to also influence and shape the ecosystem around the enterprise for a better future. In an increasingly borderless world, TCS is collaborating with various enterprises around the world 
to build a roadmap to achieve a purpose-led growth and unlock continuous business value. But before we begin, let's take a quick look at this virtual event platform. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a row of widget icons. These control the various windows which are resizable and movable. So feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop. You can also expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking the arrows on the top right corner. You can explore the content hub and book a meeting widget. Also, we'll request you to fill in the quick survey after the event. Now, I'll hand it over to Jay to present the future trends in the travel, hospitality, and other industries and enable our audience to walk away with actionable advice on how the changing technology market creates value for the enterprise. Over to you, Jay. Well, thank you very much, Addy. I'm really pleased to be here and uh, talk about some trends and predictions that we're seeing in the market. It's been an incredible, remarkable 15 months and uh, a lot of changes in that time that we haven't seen in 40 years. What I wake up every day and think about is the intersection of all of the three and a half trillion dollars that drives through the technology industry and all of the ecosystem of partners at all levels that really drive this. We know around the world in every industry, 75% of world trade goes indirectly. So it's all of these connections. It's the value, it's the co-innovation, the network effects that really drives a lot of this industry and excited to talk about that today. If we look at travel and tourism and hospitality, for example, these are industries that were well publicized during the pandemic, the early stages of the pandemic and, and where we are now in terms of taking a direct hit and being slower than other industries uh, to rebound. And it had a material impact on world GDP. As you see, almost $3 trillion was impacted last year. And we're starting to move into that rebound stage now. So we're watching very closely multiple parts of the ecosystem. We're watching, for example, you know, travel agencies and their bookings. We're, we're seeing a bump in terms of each month this year going up. Again, it's regional. We're, we're looking at differences by country, looking at differences by region around the world and different parts of the industry as well. You know, for example, in the US, there's some domestic numbers on, on flights that are showing some real promise and a return as uh, the industry and people get vaccinated and really driving this industry forward. So these are some of the things we're watching literally every day and we're watching a rebound, which again, it's a little bit of a tale of two cities. There, there's different geographic elements here. There are different elements as you look inside the sub-industries, inside travel and tourism, in terms of some bright spots and still some, some areas that, that we need to work. But here is, as we go out to the industry at Forrester, we talk to 690,000 people a year, and we're asking the questions inside of these industries, where are the dollars being spent? Where are the digital and business transformations that are happening? The move to cloud, the move to lots of different areas. And the number one area, interestingly enough, was around automation. And every company in every industry is looking at this pandemic and what was a human-based challenge in terms of sending people home. And now they're looking at their processes, their workflows, they're looking at their business logic. As they're moving more into public cloud, they're looking at ways to move humans instead of being gates inside of these workflows or processes into more uh, parallel to these processes. So really interesting in industries like robotic process automation and business process automation, we're seeing a huge surge in public cloud around hyperscalers like AWS, Microsoft and Google and others. We're watching SaaS companies, 175,000 of them around the world with no code and low code environments, really driving this era of automation. And we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about this move to public cloud. It's been phenomenal. And you're seeing results at AWS. You're seeing results at Microsoft Azure. You're seeing results in Google Cloud, top 50% year over year growth for all four quarters now inside the pandemic. This has been incredible as 
SaaS companies, which I mentioned, like Salesforce or ServiceNow, Workday, Marketo, NetSuite, are growing in the 30s. So while many of the technology categories that we're watching, some legacy hardware, some legacy applications are down by double digits, we're seeing explosive growth around public cloud and companies rethinking their businesses, rethinking the very core applications and, and layers, infrastructure layers that run their business and moving this pretty significantly. We've also seen a shift in terms of the future of work. As more people are remote, we're seeing opportunities around addressing that risk and the compliance and the security and other pieces of it, governing all of that and uh, really spending in terms of work as being something you do instead of a place that you go. And then finally, we had companies in every industry start to move from survival mode to thrive mode. And what that meant is some pretty deep investments around the customer. And we're seeing this in travel and tourism today. You know, companies didn't just take um, the year of um, very difficult results and, um, you know, sit and um, sleep through it. So they, they invested heavily in terms of rethinking the customer, rethinking the customer experience. This idea of curbside service, this idea of readdressing your customer in a very digital way. Looking at your employees, which again, it was a very, very difficult year. Looking at your partnerships around the ecosystem, addressing all of these through digital and mostly, you know, public cloud type of investments to drive that. And a huge surge in e-commerce and marketplaces that followed in terms of addressing these in a very digital way. So I wanted to end today and really walk through what we're seeing out there in the marketplace and what we see specific in this industry as well as generally in the next 18 months or so. And I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the customer first. And we know that in all industries, whether you're in B2C, B2B2C or B2B, the future buyer in four to five years, the majority of them will be millennial. So we're going through a demographic shift that we knew about before the pandemic. But during the pandemic, as buyers became more digital than ever before, we're seeing different psychology, we're seeing different behaviors than we've seen before. And we're obviously seeing a very elongated journey that uh, is becoming very defined, very digital and very digital only. And so we know that the majority of buyers are in this mode of digital or digital only and serving them from that very first moment where they need uh, a solution, they need um, a product, whatever it is that they're starting, that digital moments early in the journey is incredibly important because we know now the majority of buyers make vendor selection without ever going through traditional sales or marketing tactics. They don't want to fill in marketing forms with the correct information. They don't want to talk to salespeople in the way they did in the past. So it's finishing this digital journey with a digital transaction and never, you know, companies never getting a shot at it. So in the last few weeks, we're seeing some major changes around this buyer as well. Companies like Apple and Google are getting privacy religion. So for a buyer who wants to be anonymous during that digital or digital only journey, their now ability through mobile, which Apple and Google have 99% market share combined, or on their laptop or desktop where these two companies have 86% of browsing uh, market share combined, are making some big changes. Taking away cookies and tracking and targeting, you know, asking you if you want to be tracked inside of apps. And guess what? 96% of people in the last three weeks have said no. So this is a different way of addressing this new buyer and thinking about this new buyer. Also thinking about the future of work. I mentioned kind of remote as being part of it, but we're rethinking work as something you do instead of a place you go. And this has direct impact on the travel and tourism hospitality industry. So when we started out, it was very much a technical move in phase one. If you think of March of 2020, there was a rush to get everybody a laptop. There was a rush to get everybody a UCAS account so they could be functional at home. But when we moved into phase two, deeper questions started to arise. There was a new surface area for cybersecurity, for threats. There was a larger set of threat vectors and, and agents that were going after 
these new environments. You know, we saw different questions around productivity and effectiveness in a more remote or residential style network. We're asked about compliance as uh, people are moving around and, and, and um, executing differently. Different questions around continuity, different questions around governance. So there's a huge move in phase two around the, what we'll call the foundational or the plumbing underneath this new topology. And what's interesting as we get into phase three in the last couple of months, we're starting to see some interesting things come out in this industry. So Airbnb is starting to see with work being a place, a thing you do instead of a place you go, people are starting to rethink where they're doing work and rethink and obviously being locked down for as long as many uh, were are really looking at um, driving results. And there, there's been a big growth in, in terms of location based uh, movement. You know, think about uh, car rentals, you know, which were heavily damaged uh, in terms of a business early in the pandemic. But as the pandemic drove used car prices up, as they drove people to fly less and move more as they get vaccinated, they're seeing a surge. And there's a lot of work being done in terms of transforming those businesses to align to this growth and really drive efficiencies, which I think you'll hear later in this event. You're also seeing this migration of people. And, you know, for example, I live in Southern Florida and I'm a Canadian. You're seeing people move out of the snow if they don't have to be near a headquarters location and they happen to be working under a palm tree or they happen to be moving around the country to lower cost jurisdictions and moving from countries one to another. So a lot of different movement, which is creating unexpected opportunity in this industry. The other sh shift that we're seeing as everything moves into the public cloud, as everything is becoming as a service. So, so we know that in the hyperscaler arena in infrastructure, we know in the SaaS arena in terms of business applications and software, you know, everything is moving into this 30 day recurring subscription models. And so now we're seeing major changes on the hardware side where companies like Dell and HPE and IBM and and uh, Cisco have gone 100% all in on as a service. So you won't be able to buy a million dollar set of hardware anymore. It'll be $9,000 a month forever. So with this new buyer, these changing buying psychologies and things, we've seen a huge rush of how technology gets implemented and it's aligned to this movement to the cloud. So you see product led growth models. I mentioned Zoom earlier as a tool that people used in the pandemic and continue to grow with. That's a product led growth model. It's not traditional sales or marketing, but you use the product and at 40 minutes before it hangs up on you, you type in your credit card number. You're seeing a lot more direct consumer. And so when I think of the travel industry and things and the consumption models that are starting to move into these more direct models than ever before, everything becoming a subscription or consumption usage-based or value-based model. This is where investors are driving industries to get higher valuations, to make the business more uh, predictable, and to drive this new buyer into something they're already comfortable with. The monthly subscription to Netflix, the monthly subscription to your Dollar Shave Club and your toothbrush, and all these other things become these monthly recurring type of things. And this is something that's on the top of the mind of at least 76% of companies right now. And then this growth of marketplaces, which we talked about. And if you actually watch the hockey stick in terms of marketplaces, when I talked about this digital or digital only journey that the customer is on, they're really focused on finishing that journey digitally as well. So there was more growth in the first three months of the pandemic in marketplaces than in the last 10 years combined. And while all the companies in travel and tourism are looking at this business and digital transformation, refocusing on where the customer and how the customer wants to buy, there's a lot of interesting parts to this in terms of, is this your own marketplace and e-commerce? Is this a part of one of your partners? And how does this work in terms of the end? And so we start to focus on this digital connective tissue behind the scenes, which is really interesting. It's not the layers of the cake, the things you're going to buy. If you're going on a trip and you book a flight and then you 
book a rental car and then you book a hotel and you book some of the experiences. These layers are interesting. What we really get focused on though is the connective tissue between all of it. How does that actually connect to the customer at the very beginning? How is that customer influenced? And then during that digital journey, what are those moments? What are those specific areas of signals and, and things that we can grab as breadcrumbs to understand more of this and really plumb in the icing on the cake? And the last thing I wanna talk about is back to a stat I said earlier. 76% of CEOs think their current business model will be unrecognizable in five years. And this is a huge number. This touches every industry. It touches every size of customer. It touches every region of the world. Everyone is in a business transformation, which is really a digital transformation. This move to cloud, this move to automation, this move to customer first experience. So I wanted to use an example with Airbnb, which I mentioned earlier in the travel industry. And as they look at their business and like others, they suffered, suffered about a 30 or 35% drop in last year's results. But while they were going through that, they very much focused on their ecosystem. And I start looking at the APIs and the developers and the applications and all the other pieces and parts that make this work. So when you talk about the digital connective tissue, when you talk about the icing and the layers between each of these uh, parts of the cake, we're getting really interested in where the customers are going to go to put all of this together, to really drive experience, to drive um, results for everyone in the ecosystem. And you may own, as part of this industry, that base layer of the ecosystem, or you may participate in others. So your flight might be booked on the airline's website, and then you'll move through that and add perhaps a hotel or Airbnb and, and rental cars and things like that, or it might be upside down. You might start here and then book your flight and then book. The fact of the matter is there's going to be some super winners here in this connective tissue. And this is the transformation that these customers and companies are going through in terms of focusing on customers and really focusing on where that customer is going to end up at every stage of their journey. And by the way, the journey doesn't end when that purchase happens on the marketplace. It's getting to that point of renewal, getting to that point of retention, making sure that the customer in the future adopts this as the way they're going to travel in the future. The integration and stickiness into their habits and their daily lives, the upsell, the cross-sell, the enrichment, all of this goes on pretty much every 30 days forever. So this is changing every industry. It's changing all the different players in the ecosystem. So we're not as focused anymore on the transaction. You know, that's obviously important, but in many cases now that transaction is just the first trigger to that long-term renewal of business. And what we really are focused on now with all these moving parts is one, getting to the point of value creation. You know, one plus one equals three in front of the client, the customer. Number two is focusing on really the network effects. Again, where that customer ends up and through all the different parts of that journey, making sure that you can leverage other partnerships to really make that happen. And when you're looking at public cloud, when you're looking at these larger transformations, it is all an ecosystem view. It's not setting up a web page with an e-commerce site to it. It's really understanding all of the different influences that customer has and making sure that you're taking advantage. And then number three, it's really around co-innovation. We're at the early stages here of the public cloud move. Today, we have 175,000 SaaS companies, for example. I predict we'll have a million of them in 10 years. We're at the early stages of really driving everything, every part, every workflow, every process, every part of that customer journey becomes truly fully digital. And that's where this co-innovation is just getting started. We haven't even dreamed up yet what's gonna happen in the next 10 years in this industry, as well as others. New layers of personalization that we haven't thought about before, given the privacy we talked about, customization, digitization, and automation is what companies are thinking about, and they're really driving these results. So I wanna thank you 
very much for uh, sitting through this session. And I'm excited for the, uh, the rest of the event and the panels and everything else. And I'd like to send it back to Addy. Thank you, Jay, for the interesting session. It's amazing to see how 76% of the global CEOs feel that their business model would be unrecognizable over the next five years. At TCS, we believe that the evolution of technology and the changing paradigm of industry adoption of digital capabilities would lead firms to adopt to ecosystemic value, which is going to be a key ingredient for their survival and success. On that note, I'd like to now hand it over to Gerard to talk to us about how he has led and shaped the entire transformation of the Avis Budget Group on cloud. Over to you, Gerard. Thank you, Addy. Looking back several years ago, uh, we began our journey to the cloud. At the time, we were up against a rate shop phenomenon like never before. We were getting a billion rate shops in and it was driving our costs on our main plain, mainframe platform. With that, we had, to, we had to do something about it. We couldn't scale to meet the future growth projections and our costs were going um, out of whack in line uh, with our revenue where the cost of our rate shopping was, was going at a much higher clip than our re revenue growth. With that said, it was then we sat and decided that we needed to do something about it. And we then uh, chose to, to come up with a modernization plan of our core, core applications, our proprietary applications, our reservation rental and rate shop, and to migrate our rate shop engine to the cloud. Uh, at the time, we thought it was unbelievable, the, the amount of uh, processing that we were handling at a billion uh, transactions. Looking back, now we're going to actually finish the year uh, with a projection of 20 billion rate shops. That was uh, 20 times far, far greater than we would have ever expected. And we would have been uh, at a cost base that was outrageous. With that said, uh, we chose to, uh, at the same time, while moving to the cloud, we knew we needed to refactor our current applications and modernize them from assembly language to C. And we also moved from old uh, legacy hierarchical databases to relational databases. And we did that in a very quick fashion. And at the time when we, we started the program, uh, we started to uh, talk about how are we gonna do this is as important as doing it. And so we spent a little more time uh, in the de devising the, the form formula on how we were going to move the model. Uh, we took time to, to uh, review our uh, you know, continuous integration and, and uh, development process. And at the time, we also included our security capabilities and we automated the entire process. Uh, we also architected it so it was a highly available, high, highly resilient environment and uh, it was geographically dispersed in the AWS cloud. Looking back, I, I look at uh, what we did and where we are now, we would have never been able to meet the needs. We would have gone through lots of, lots of business impact if we hadn't take, taken that leap at the time. Uh, with that said, this really set a great foundation for us. Uh, we, we continue to use the model uh, for our future uh, move to the cloud on what we based it on in the beginning. So we we're real happy with with the choices we made uh, in how we, how we did that initially. Um, looking forward, we're now in a position uh, post COVID where we've all in our industries and several industries have gone through some pretty considerable uh, change uh, in, in our staffing and, and uh, in our environments have changed considerably. Uh, the travel industry has taken a, a huge toll during the pandemic. And now as, as we start to come out of it, we see great opportunities are in our industry, and we're at a real inflection point uh, with taking taking the road forward. Uh, we believe there's tremendous opportunities with um, getting more uh, value out of our existing customers, gaining more market share in the industry and in, in our core industry and the uh, mobility industry at large. 
We believe there's great opportunities to capture uh, and opportunities to reinvent our processes and automate and use automation to automate both our business and technology processes. Uh, we believe there's uh, the ability to, to move more towards a data-driven decision process um, and focused on the customer experience and our employee experience. With that said, uh, we've made a decision uh, recently to um, continue the transformation and to complete the job. So we're about to embark on a three, uh, three and a half year journey to continue and complete the entire modernization process of our entire enterprise. This will not just be a technology driven uh, item. This is going to, be, going to be the entire enterprise with our business and our technology teams uh, moving uh, to reorganize, to support a new agile methodology process across the enterprise, across the globe. Uh, we're formulating a, uh, a pitch deck now that we're going to look to sell our board on in the upcoming months. And we're hopeful that before year end, we'll be in full, full operation of our new transformation uh, off the mainframe and to the cloud. We do um, have targeted to go to our AW, use the AWS platform because uh, we have some great experience that we developed in the, uh, to, to this point. Um, we have some, some additional experience that we've gained through our connected car and our fleet uh, services uh, that we've put in, into the AWS cloud with our next uh, gen platform. And we're gonna build upon that to uh, take it to the next level. With that said, um, get, you know, getting to this point has not been easy, uh, but we're really excited about our future going forward. I would like to thank and recognize T T TCS in what they've helped us contribute towards our initial foundation building uh, with our initial programs to the cloud. And we do believe TCS will be there to support us and contribute along the way as we embark on the uh, finishing the job of this transformation, transformation to the cloud. Uh, with that said, we think we're gonna bring our business to the next level and uh, bring new capabilities to our customers uh, with the ability to differentiate ourselves from our competitors and to continue to grow in our industry and take advantage of the new agile mindset and the ability to move quickly on our fleet and our feet uh, and with a move towards data-driven processes and automation across the enterprise globally. With that said, uh, I thank you for taking the time to listen to my story and I'd like to turn it back over to Addy. Thank you, Addy. Amazing, Gerard. That was a wonderful session. We are honored to be your transformation partner. Now I'd like to invite Scott to share how Wyndham Hotels and Resorts took hospitality to the cloud. Please welcome Scott. Thank you, Addy. Really to understand the cloud journey at Wyndham Hotels and Resorts, we have to spend about 30 seconds understanding who is Wyndham and Hotels and Resorts to start with. So we're the world's largest franchisor of hotels. We have about 8,900 hotels and about 6,000 franchisees across roughly 95 countries right now. And that allows us to actually reach out to 86 to 87 million loyalty members. So it gives us a really big reach. And if you think about those loyalty members, there's one of our drivers for cloud right there. How do I store all of that loyalty data? We're primarily focused on what we call in North America as drive to sort of business, meaning in all of New York City, we have 12 hotels. But as soon as you get outside of New York City and you're driving down the highway, there's a Wyndham every 10 minutes. So every 10 miles or so, you can pull off into one of our 20 brands. And speaking of our 20 brands, We've arranged them here from top to bottom, from most economical to what we have in terms of our luxury segment. So we have a brand for everyone. You know, Travel Lodge, which we situate near national parks, to Days Inn, which is one of our most numerous ones, to Super 8s, and then all the way up to our Wyndham's and Wyndham Grands. We believe in democratizing travel, meaning that we want travel to be available for everyone, regardless of income level. Okay, so now let's go into a little bit more about our cloud journey and our ultimate business strategy and how they come together. We benefit greatly at Wyndham IT because 
our IT strategy is part of our business strategy. There's three key pillars to our overall business strategy. One, we have to demonstrate good brand quality. Basically, if we have good brands, franchisees want to join our system. We have to continually grow that system so that they recognize that their investment, for example, in a Super 8 or a Days In, is going to pay off because we're growing that brand for them. We invest in loyalty, sales, and marketing for them to help market those brands, to distribute those brands across the globe, to make sure that their inventory is represented in any channel that somebody wants to purchase it, whether it's an OTA, whether it's our direct website channels, or hey, people still use voice sometimes, and if they wanna call up and make a reservation that way, we've got their hotel represented there as well. And then finally, we enable all of that through technology solutions. At Wyndham IT, we like to joke that we put the people in IT, and we've designed our own logo. You can see it there at the top of the slide, where the I is part of a stylized person. Our journey ultimately focuses on using best-in-class platforms. So when we talk about best-in-class, we've broken it down into four or five key areas. And over the years, we've made massive investments in moving out of physical data centers and into either SaaS-based applications or applications we built ourselves on an entirely cloud-native architecture. So for example, our digital platform is completely set up on a single global digital platform across those 95 countries meaning that no matter what country you're accessing it from, you're hitting a single platform, it just may be translated into different languages. Our central reservation system is set up across all 20 of our brands in a single global instance. Again, distributing that inventory globally for us. Property management, we've now standardized on two property management systems, recently making a pretty big announcement in terms of a partnership there across the world, meaning that you walk into our hotels, our goal is for them to be running one of two property management systems globally. And then finally, we have the cloud infrastructure. So for those applications that are not SaaS based, what does our cloud infrastructure look like? How do we build those out? How do we distribute, secure, scale, all those good uh, IT terms across the world? And in that case, we've chosen a single cloud. Uh, we're moving forward with Amazon Web Services. We have been on a cloud journey you know, with Amazon for about three years or so, and we'll be at the end of this year, 90% cloud native in terms of our AWS workload. What's the benefits of some of that? You know, People talk about scalability and security and everything else, but ultimately it's about using that cloud operating model. Once you've moved out to the cloud, you can't just do things the way you used to. You have to rethink it a little bit. So. It enables us to deploy new environments a lot faster for our developers, which lets them bring solutions for our business a lot faster than they could before. It allows us to use resources in an elastic manner. Ooh, that's fancy. What's that really mean, Addy? What that means is that as business goes up, we use those resources more, we pay more. But then when business goes down, the same thing. We're headed into a great summer right now. We believe our business is going to be coming up. We're happy to pay a little bit more for those resources. As we cycle down into a slower period, we'll pay less. That allows our costs to flex up and down. We always like to leverage Moore's Law in our favor, meaning that IT gets cheaper every year. And if you're in the cloud, you can benefit from the cheapness and the inherent cheapness in that year over year. We get continuous innovation from our partners. So as we moved into the cloud and partnering with folks like TCS and AWS, we receive innovation built in. How many new offerings does AWS come out with every year? Something like two, 300, can't even keep up with that. But by partnering with them, we get those offerings quote unquote for free. So in order to enable all of this, what do you have to do? What does this require? We have to monitor it. You can't just put it out there and hope it works. So you have to monitor what's going on in an environment and you have to encourage your team to make the big leap. There's gonna be education required. I referred to the 200, 300, 400 new services that become available every year. So you have to educate your teams on that. But perhaps most importantly, you have to let go. You have to let it go in terms of what you used to do before. You don't have to understand everything that's going on in that environment. That's why you're paying a partner. That's why you're leveraging one of the best companies in the world for that. But you have to know enough. So we've had to encourage our folks to make like the snowman and let it go in terms of some of their architecture and architectural type decisions. 
Ultimately though, our cloud journey is enabled by partnerships. What starts off as a vendor engagement, you know, bringing somebody in, oh, can you provide a few bodies who know skill A or skill B, then evolves into a partnership opportunity. That's what happened to us, for example, in somebody like TCS. It evolved into a true partnership opportunity where we said, this is our business goal. This is our North Star. Let's work together. Let's co-invest to get there. And we built that business relationship. Too often when people on my side of the fence talk about partnerships with a vendor, they just want a lower price. Certainly price is important. Yes, we want a fair price, but what's more important every time is the business outcome. And if we can partner together to drive that business outcome, then we've really worked together to create something special. So thank you very much, Addy, for the opportunity to share our story. Thank you, Scott. It is amazing to see how cloud has been central to your global business transformation. Now let us welcome Florian from AWS to share his presentation on transforming business with innovation in the world of travel and hospitality. Thanks, Eddie. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts on transforming business with innovation from an Amazon Web Services uh, perspective. If we think about innovation, the first thing that comes to our mind is our culture of innovation. Amazon's approach to innovation has remained consistent since the company first launched. The most radical and transformative business invention are often those that empower others to unleash their creativity. Jeff's statement is an invitation for all of us to start every process with the customer and work backwards, customer obsession, to think long-term by, see, by being stubborn on the vision, but flexible on the details, and be willing to fail. It is the same mental model that drives our charter in travel and hospitality to help companies in their business transformation through the AWS cloud. As a global industry practice, we cover multiple segments such as airlines, airports, cruise lines, lodging, restaurants, casinos, entertainment venues, ground transport, and technology providers. Empowering others, as Jeff said, to innovate is where our partners come in. For this, we recently launched the AWS Travel and Hospitality Partner Competency. This is an industry-first program. It helps customers to connect with top partners that have deep domain expertise and a proven track record of success. I call it a North Star, and it is a differentiation program. It's the highest bar we have to offer for consulting and technology partners. They go through a very, very intensive validation, and when they come out of that, they are really ready to bring all of this to market together. I'm very proud to share that TCS is part of the program as one of our strategic partners. And together with our partners, we help leading travel and hospitality companies to reinvent. For us, these use cases are the best sources to provide examples of how we successfully partnered with customers to move faster to market, scale, and be agile. I want to start my journey with a booking, actually with Priceline, which is part of uh, Booking Holdings. And the online travel agency at the onset of the pandemic experienced a three times increase in call volume. Using a cloud-based contact center with Amazon Connect, they were able to shift to working remotely and manage that spike in volume. And this is what kicked the flywheel of business transformation moving forward. An update for the interactive voice response system that could take months in the past is now as simple as typing a message into Amazon Polly. Amazon Polly is a service that turns text into lifelike speech, available to Amazon Connect users. As a result, automated functions like these have freed up Priceline's developers to innovate in response to an ever-changing world. With an example that's Back to my background, where I come from, the airline industry, 
um, United Airlines was faced with another challenge to transform their business with innovation. Over 1 billion visits a year on their digital channels. Such an adoption is a goldmine to personalize customer interactions. And it became a top priority for the airline. They started to leverage AWS machine learning across the whole customer travel journey to increase engagement with one-on-one -on -one game formats like Mileplay. Through this personalization, United Airlines can enable its customers to explore trip ideas, receive curated flight and seat recommendations, and get relevant content at the right time. What we learned from Praveen, whom I quote here, is what almost every customer tell us. Leveraging AWS services like MLAI helps to do more and faster with less resources because it is automated. I round up my examples with food and with one of America's most iconic food brands. Imagine you run over 7,000 restaurants in the US alone and literally from one day to the other, everything rapidly shifts to delivery and drive through all ordered online. Taco Bell had to integrate with the major delivery providers and deliver their own complex menu across multiple digital channels to those delivery providers in real time. To transform the business model with such a short period of time, rapidly, they had to get really inventive. And they used serverless on AWS to focus less on managing servers, but to move to market faster, adapt at scale, and do this with a pay-per-value model. Now, if we think about innovating and transforming business with innovation, by design or not, all these three customer stories champion the three overarching principles in our Amazon culture of innovation. They were obsessed about their end customer. They were ready to take a risk. And despite the short-term challenge they faced unprecedentedly through the pandemic, they focused on how AWS can help them for build what's next. With this, thanks again for having me and uh, back to you, Adi. Thank you, Florian for the insights on how AWS looks at innovation shaping the world of travel and hospitality in the recent times. Now I'd like to invite all of you for a panel discussion on how enterprises can build resilient and agile ecosystems with cloud. We'll start with you, Jay. Please tell us, what is your perspective on the emergence of new ecosystems in the world of travel and hospitality? Yeah, so ecosystems is something that I wake up every day uh, thinking about and, and researching. So it's really interesting in this industry that was really set up on large alliances and partnerships in the past, where an airline, a hotel, a car rental agency would come together, you know, to piece together a vacation, for example. Well, in, as we're going forward, and especially as we're coming out of the pandemic, people are moving more into experiences. And when you start to think about the last mile of experiences, and the dozens or soon to be hundreds of experiential type of uh, trips and travel and, and everything else, you now think about the long tail of all of these different types of packages. And this is now the ecosystem of bringing together those obviously important logistics, but on the back end, making the entire thing uh, a solution, almost like you'd make a business solution or a business outcome uh, for uh, for a consumer. So it's very exciting times. Thank you, Jay. It's very interesting to hear from you on that. So Florian, uh, especially from an AWS perspective, the last two years, a lot of ch changes have happened in the base of innovation at AWS. Could you highlight some of the latest developments in the travel and hospitality industry that would help them in the years to come from a cloud perspective? Sure. 2020 has certainly been a giant wake up call for cloud adoption. And while it's a period that none of us would wish on anybody or ever to repeat, um, when I think about AWS innovation, the first thing that comes to my mind are the many examples of travel and hospitality companies who innovated in the face of disruption. We can learn a lot from them and how they used 
multiple AWS services to recover and build a resilient business. I always like to start with food. Domino's Pizza uh, used AWS machine learning to predict pizza delivery. Um, McDonald's scaled home delivery to over 30,000 restaurants. Um, Starlines, the world's largest alliance, chose to go all in, all in on AWS backed by TCS. And during the pandemic, they were able to reduce their infrastructure total cost of ownership by an initial 25% and provide services to keep travelers safe. So in a post-pandemic world, Starlines can now run their business with the same elasticity as the AWS cloud, which to me is the real definition of an agile business. Now, if we look at highlights in terms of AWS service innovations that help customers in the recovery and beyond, there's so many, I pick a few that we recently launched and that are very relevant and I, I think purposeful and interesting for travel and hospitality companies. AWS Panorama is a managed service for computer vision. You can deploy it to edge devices. Think about contactless checking, social distancing, food freshness for queue management. Now, in the industry that depends so heavily on customer service, we also saw companies taking huge advantage of Amazon Connect to reinvent their contact center. This is something that I think I would really call out because the ability to deploy it literally within minutes with MLAI embedded from the start has been a game changer during the pandemic for many customers. And I, I want to finish with a couple of the new features we released here because as we continue to listen to our customers, we, we deploy new things that um, relate to Connect. With Amazon Connect Wisdom, we made it easier for the agent to have the right information available in real time, exactly as the customer would ask. So that drastically reduces the time searching for answers if you're in a call center and you have a customer on the line. Real-time contact lens is what the call center uh, um, staff would like because it, it helps real-time call analytics capabilities. It enables to detect customer sentiment during live calls and obviously also help to resolve them faster. So moving forward, I think what customers can expect from us in terms of innovations is a lot of technology, but I want to close with the most important part. It's about the transformation of people and culture in the cloud journey. And that's where I think there's another important piece of innovation we can help. Thank you, Florian. That's, that's really very insightful in terms of innovations. And as you rightly said, it's about the transformation of people and culture, which sort of brings back to me the point which Scott made about how he had looked at uh, the cloud and more importantly, how it how Windham has looked at single global platforms across 95 countries, right, Scott? And you talked about how we have looked at certain of the common platforms towards enabling business transformation. So, Scott, in at Windham, going forward now with what you've accomplished in the last three years, how do you see cloud being central to your business strategy? And how, how are you looking at leveraging the most of the future capabilities of cloud towards transforming your business? Thank you, Addy. Cloud is going to be critically important to us as we move forward, and it has been in the past as well. I like to think of cloud as really supporting business outcomes. With 87 million loyalty members globally, if you're trying to come into a hotel and they're looking for your record, there's no way they can find your record in a reasonable amount of time without cloud. If you're trying to check in globally and use a single mobile application, no matter where you are, any of our 9,000 hotels, there's no way we could enable that without cloud. So ultimately, we see it as part of the, the digital fabric for Wyndham, Wyndham Hotels, and Wyndham IT on a go-forward basis to enable the business to achieve these types of outcomes. Really impressive, Scott. We'll come back to that in a minute in terms of some of the future initiatives you're talking about. So moving on to you, Gerard. Uh, when you took the decision to look at cloud, right, uh, and it was about how you are looking at handling the volumes of transactions, right, and um, where you where you started a journey to where you are today, your transaction volumes have gone up twenty times, right, to over twenty billion transactions and and more and counting. So, what is the future here for you at Avis from a cloud perspective? What is your ambition of how you see cloud transform the business from where you have started to where your where the future holds for you in your business? Well, thank you, Eddie. Um, we see cloud as uh, really the critical 
and integral to everything we do going forward to differentiate ourselves. If you take a look at, uh, you know, over the last several years, one of the problems we faced was uh, we really wanted to reinvent our business to automate everything end to end. And we really couldn't do that with some of the systems we had. And if you take a look at what we've done in particular to our connected car strategy, when we faced the problem uh, a little over two years ago, and we had a connected car service that was working, but we wanted to scale this out through the entire enterprise globally. And we realized that uh, doing it on our current on-premise platform was just not gonna work. The amount of data we collect from the telematics is tremendous. We have so much opportunity to analyze it and do analytics. And we really needed machine learning. So by moving to the cloud, we've built uh, proper ingestion engines to ingest tr tremendous amounts of telematic data. And we've set up an entire data flat platform in the AWS cloud with the proper machine learning, analytics, rules engines. And we now are gonna put ourselves in a position to utilize the data and, and interrogate the data and build rules that will trigger events on a time basis, on a uh, in, indication of some criteria. And, and we've done considerable automation uh, over the last 18 months. Um, if you take a look at um, our cars, we check in automatically and uh, uh, probably about 70% of our vehicles nowadays in the past, we would uh, be so busy, we couldn't possibly check them in. Uh, we, they would actually get checked back out before they get checked in. And we had lots of issues in our back office systems because the, the records weren't getting closed out. If I take that alone, the value that's brought to our operation is tremendous. And, and it, it's not only an automation for our employees to improve upon their lives, but it, it, the customers gets the differentiated results from it. They, if you take a look at during the pandemic, the touchless experience became uh, you know, critical. Well, this enabled us to actually uh, really roll that out in, in great form and, and have a completely touchless experience for our customers. Wonderful, Jared, thank you for that. And uh, just looking back in time to what you had mentioned about connected cars and the future which you, which you are setting up as foundation. If there's anything which you would like to see change uh, in terms of your foundation decisions which you took in the past for, as part of the mainframes, would you advise something for the audience here on what were the two, three things which they would they should consider for laying a good foundation? I would, Adi, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say we'd change much. And, and that's because what I would suggest for everyone is to really do the work up front because I think we did a fantastic job. Um, you know, engage the proper partners because I don't believe any organization really will have the skills necessary to lay the architecture foundation for the cloud uh, because we haven't been doing it for that long. And so we've, we've uh, gotten some great results uh, from partnering with Amazon, uh, from partnering with TCS, uh, partners like Slalom, and they, we brought that experience in. And up front, we laid out all our technology stack standards. Uh, we laid out the architecture and really laid that architecture out for where we wanted to go and be, not where we were coming from. And that has paid dividends because uh, we haven't had a lot of redos. Um, so, and that goes from, I would say, make sure security is part of the process. Make sure automation, your DevOps process, whatever you lay out today is going to stay and it's gonna be very difficult to change. So as good as you can make it to what you want it to be, you should try to get that right out of the gate. That's, that's a wonderful advice, thank you for that. Scott, moving on to you, uh, you talked about uh, how you are seeing the entire transformation span across the Wyndham Group right, uh, companies across 95 countries. And uh, you talked about the journey of implementing those global digital platforms. And the, the, if I recall right, you talked about best in class platforms. So how has it been received by your customers? What does the journey look like for towards as you were implementing those platforms? Could you share some insights on that for, for all of us? Absolutely. 
It's been a lot of fun for us to see the transformation internally, but it's been even more fun to see some of the expressions on guest faces as we brought these new capabilities to bear for both them and our franchisees. Ultimately, hospitality is about interacting with your guest or your customer in the way they want to be interacted with. So in some cases, they want to have that face-to-face -face communication. In other cases, they do not. Now, when the COVID crisis hit, that accelerated adoption of digital technology more than we ever could have predicted. So suddenly things like QR code scanning, contactless payments, mobile check-in and mobile check-out, whereas you know, maybe the business traveler would have just used that in the past, now the more senior traveler, the truck driver was doing this because they had to in order to continue to be on the road and to continue to travel. So it accelerated the pace of digital adoption. What was really cool about that is because we had been on this digital journey and invested in our single platforms. So that allowed us to innovate a lot faster than some of our competitors. We also continued to make those investments during the downturn so that now as we're coming up to hopefully a, a great summer and with a lot of people on the road, people will be able to get out, experience some of those digital innovations and also still experience some of that Wyndham hospitality. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and, and as you mentioned, and Gerard also talked about it in terms of shaping the future experience, right? And uh, really looking forward to a summer which is truly different to the previous ones you've all experienced. And um, on that note, we want to definitely talk about the seamless and touchless experience, which Scott, you mentioned, and Gerard also talked about it from a connected cars in the future. But before you get there, Florian, Coming back to you, when you, when you talked about AWS and the innovation at AWS on the world of travel and hospitality, you talked about Connect and you talked about uh, some of the capabilities towards rekindling customer loyalties, right? And uh, what are your thoughts in uh, looking at how such technologies from AWS can rekindle demand, right, in the world of travel and hospitality by uh, leveraging the customer data which you would have in an ecosystem? Yeah, it's. That's a great point. Thank you. I think what we learned from customers is that loyalty is one of the top areas for brands to reinvent. And let me call it simply loyalty plus. It's the idea of transforming loyalty from a transactional level towards real time customer centricity. And if we take a stab at the pandemic, there were a lot of strategies to reduce first the loss of existing bookings. So like Airbnb, uh, an AWS customer pivoted with innovation and they offered experiences at home. Or um, you had a more unconventional approach to loyalty was to offer passengers these flights to nowhere. Uh, by the way, they sold out in 10 minutes. So uh, fast forward, if you look at it with an AWS lens, we believe a best in class loyalty program requires to focus on two things, customer data intelligence and omni-channel personalization. If you think about it, the future point of sale will be wherever your guests, passengers, your rental car drivers will be. It could be a mobile chat. It could be voice in the car. It could even be a video game. And if you think about the customer profile, it's not just knowing who they are, like age and location. Loyalty Plus means to transform those profiles into customer data in intelligence to generate what we call predictive insights. Now, AWS provides a suite of services that customers can use uh, to create that single source of truth of customer data. And um, on top of that, you can create loyalty offers. Some of the services that are very well known combine Amazon Personalize and Amazon Pinpoint into predictive user engagement. It's like, make me an offer before I know it. Deliver me something I like before I ask. And I, I want to close with an really, uh, I would say a funny example where this all comes together. Um, a great example of how a business can harness loyalty in its context was the, I don't know if you heard about the Whopper Detour campaign from Burger King. It was powered by AWS partner Braze and the idea was as simple as effective. You give out one cent Whoppers, yeah, one cent Whoppers to customers, but only if they opened the Burger King mobile app within 600 feet off, and I won't mention it, another large QSR chain. It boosted loyalty by 50%. And if you look at it, this is where Scott talked about um, delight and um, Gerard said this and like delight and know your customer and um, do things that they also, they like that are 
gentle and delightful um, surprises. So that's where we believe it's loyalty is all about delivering end to end high value journeys that matter on the channels that guests and passengers prefer. Thank you, Florian. And uh, as you said, one of these omni-channel experiences and more importantly, the ability to mass personalize, as we call it in TCS, right? To be able to leverage the technologies to bring the unique value to each and every customer becomes a, a future on which travel and hospitality industry pr pr prides over. So on that note, Gerard, uh, coming back to you, how have you set up uh, taking up these innovations into your enterprise? How does your internal organization evaluate these innovations and you talked about connected to us how do you bring this whole thing to life in terms of your people and capabilities well, we're, we're actually still kind of going through the transformation process and and again this is not just a technology uh transformation this requires the entire business to come along with it so we have engaged the business as as capability leaders and we're we're implementing a, an entire agile process and we have our business leaders actually driving uh, what the, they want as the outcomes. And we basically drive the technology enhancements and, and an investment to drive those outcomes. It's completely end to end. Uh, the business is engaged and involved and we're fully focused on outcomes. We're also at the same time, we can't really get there unless we complete the job of the transformation from a technology perspective. So we're in the process of uh, uh, getting started on, on completing the job, uh, moving off the mainframe fully uh, and getting taking care of some technical debt that we've we've still have to take care of, because it won't be until we get to that point where we can truly be agile. There are still some constraints in being fully agile uh, as long as you have some of the technical debt. And, and that's, you know, when you have a when when you've been around for over 75 years, Obviously, you started somewhere and you, you have a bit of technical debt to take care of. We've made some great progress. We've got a great foundation. And uh, over the next three years, I think we're going to get to the promised land. And, and that's really what it comes down to. So we are reorganizing the teams into our agile processes. We're changing roles. Uh, we're moving people into the right roles. And we're upskilling and obviously working with partners to bring in some of those skills. Great. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Scott, over to you. Uh, how are you looking at it uh, in your world, in the world of innovation and how you have set up your, your teams towards this? In a similar manner to Gerard's, we're just a little farther along, I think, on that journey. Uh, you absolutely have to engage the business on this. You also have to look and say, okay, this is not just IT. This is real change management and change management in the terms of who moved my cheese. You know, you're redefining these roles and responsibilities for people. You're recommunicating to folks that, yes, we're moving to the cloud, but you'll still have a role. Yes, you'll still have a role if you continue to demonstrate some of those attributes that have always been critical to IT professionals. For example, are you always willing to keep up with the best? Are you willing to learn the newest AWS services? Earlier, we heard Florian talk about all these new services they introduce. Well, if they introduce them and we don't know about them, they're no good to us. So you have to be able to continue to stay focused on continuing education. Second, you have to be engaged with your vendor partners. So we're leveraging TCS as part of this transformation, but you have to look at them as a partner. This is not a competitor. This is not just a vendor. This is a true partner. So you identify those roles and responsibilities across IT, internal, and across TCS, and you flex those back and forth. You also have to say, what do I need to automate internally in order to keep up? Again, something we've always done. All of us as IT leaders have done, but it's a little bit different in the cloud. So how do I automate my QA function? How do I automate my release management function so that now I can keep up with some of what I'm going to be able to do in the cloud? And then finally, you've got to have responsible IT professionals. And ultimately, you know, in a cloud environment, that means turning off the lights. We can't be provisioning instances without bringing them back down. You know, we can't be buying, in effect, some of uh, these cloud capabilities without also turning the lights off when we're done with it. Right. And, and it's interesting you mentioned about how we, uh, Dr. I sense a lot, intend to be sustainable, right? In terms of being relevant from a talent perspective to ensure that, you know, the cloud operating model to make it sustainable needs some adaptation, right? On our side to make it work as well. So that we have those practices. So thank you, Scott, for that. 
So leading on, um, one of the things which has been in my mind when, when I talk to customers is about how do we convince the security and compliance guys that we move to the cloud? And uh, how do we, and you, both of you talked about bringing the business along and the business says, guys, we trust you. You are the IT leaders. You, you know how to transform us to the cloud. Tell us, you, you, how do we take your security and compliance? So how has been your experience, Scott, with security and compliance on the cloud? Right? How has it worked? Anything which you could uh, give us some practices to take away? Absolutely can there. Uh, so what's interesting is four, five, eight years ago, when people were talking about the cloud may or may not be secure, or I have concerns about moving to the cloud, usually people who brought that up were trying to justify their big internal data center investments. And they were trying to apply that way of thinking to cloud security. So as we migrated uh, out into two AWS instances, we set up the security parameter first. So we had a six month project where we, all we did was focus on security and setting up the security fence and the defense and depth strategy before we moved our first application. So that would be the first lesson that I would offer. The second is don't get distracted by some of these high profile cases where they say, oh, uh, something bad happened in the cloud. You know, somebody forgot to set a password. That can just as easily happen in a physical data center. You know, if somebody uh, leaves the password for admin as admin, that can happen in a physical data center or in a cloud instance. It doesn't matter. So don't, don't let that keep you away from actually uh, performing your cloud migration. And thirdly, recognize regardless of where you're at, the weakest point of anything you do in security, unfortunately, is going to be your people. Uh, when there are breaches, when there are concerns, generally, those are coming from social engineering. You know, and that's not even especially difficult to do, you know, in some, in some industries. So don't look at it as data center versus cloud. Look at it as how do I establish a security mindset across my organization? How do I train the business to think about security? Because ultimately, that's where the breach is going to come from. It's not necessarily going to come from one of these brute force attacks where they're, you know, trying to deny you service or guess passwords uh, randomly. Right. Thank you, Scott. Gerard, over to you. You did focus a lot uh, as part of your journey on data-driven uh, capabilities, and you mentioned automation. So in the context, again, to uh, what uh, you have looking to envisage in your world at Tavis, uh, how do you see security and compliance uh, in the world of connected cars and is there anything different to what uh, we would have done from a cloud perspective? Well, with security, we've actually built in the security uh, into the DevOps process. And so a lot of the configurations are locked in as part of the automation and it actually gives us a better control over it. So as long as you get it right up front in the configuration and, and obviously uh, all the other controls that you need, uh, you know, the seams, uh, you have to be paying attention. And to what Scott mentioned, you know, as long as you have uh, people, we have, we have about 30,000 employees. As long as you have 30,000 employees, you're always going to have risk. So education and awareness is job one. And obviously these days, you know, most of the uh, infiltrations coming from email. So uh, phishing uh, training, phishing exercises, putting tools in, uh, DMARC and DKIM type tools, these all come into play. So that doesn't change just because you're going to the cloud. Uh, the cloud can actually make it easier, uh, but you know a lot of these things don't change. They're pretty standard, whether you're in, a, in an on-prem, uh, in a mainframe or a cloud uh, environment. So what I take away from, from hearing from both of you is the security is, is more in the hands of the people. They're, they need to be mindful and they need to be educated. So whether it's on-prem or cloud, the business systems still continue to be business systems, which is the responsibility of the people who support them, right? And uh, as AWS also puts it, uh, the security in the cloud is always our responsibility. It's the customer's responsibility. And the more we automate the security controls, the, the more effective it becomes to manage them. So on that note, Jay, uh, one of the points you did touch upon uh, in your presentation was about how we look at uh, the changing world of uh, cloud benefits. So in your world, Jay, um, from you, how do you see the right mix of automation versus human touch? We heard uh, Gerard and Scott talk about 
various initiatives and sort of Florian. So in your perspective, what would that be in terms of a mix which you would advise on how much automation should you go for? Yeah, absolutely. So automation is the number one spending area right now in the world. And for all those big numbers I talked about in terms of cloud, uh, it's actually growing faster. And uh, so we're watching now as humans, you know, which were in many cases the gates inside many workflows, many processes, a lot of business logic was wrapped around people. And while people are incredibly important, we got to free them up from being gates inside workflows into the creative process, into really driving this new experiential era of travel and tourism and everything else. So automation can go and replicate a lot of the, what we'll call the day-to-day -day workflow that, uh, that humans were doing in the past and get more predictive and prescriptive in terms of driving that forward. Thank you, Jay, for that. And uh, so leading on to one of my favorite topics now is around talent transformation. So Gerard Scott, we, we, you did touch upon how you are uh, equipping your organizations by investing in training, by investing in uh, becoming, for them to become more aware beyond the technology of using the cloud. So there is top one or two things, Gerard, which you would advise for all the listeners here on what should be the focus on talent transformation from a cloud perspective, what would that be? I would say that the, uh, the biggest uh, focus is to move to a product uh, oriented mindset. And, and I think, you know, bringing in um, top experts uh, from agile coaches, uh, scrum masters uh, to come in and infiltrate your organization uh, and become part of it. And those people train and, and, you know, what we do here in our Agile framework, uh, we actually have a maturity for each team and we rate uh, the maturity of each team. And then the Agile coaches uh, work with each team to say what they need to do to get to the next level of maturity. And so, you know, obviously KPIs and metrics are, are very important. And, and I think as you reskill the organization, that's something you should keep on top of that will guarantee that you make continue to make progress and get, get there over time. Thank you, Jared. Scott, your views on how you see the global talent being managed? So I completely agree with uh, Gerard's points there. I would also add, when you think about a cloud transformation, it can also be a career transformation for some of the folks in your global talent pool. So somebody who perhaps was a mainframe or a Unix uh, developer, maybe they've always wanted to learn about high volume data ingestion. What a good opportunity for them to go out then and take an AWS class you know, or, or have free AWS certification. We've actually seen our folks get reinvigorated because they recognize we are investing in them and then they have cool projects coming out of this because part of the transformation is we've got all these projects queued up and waiting for the cloud environments to be established. So it's a win-win. They get new skills, and as soon as they get those new skills, they get to apply them to really relevant business-type projects. Very interesting perspectives, uh, Gerard and Scott. So, Brian, moving on to you uh, in terms of uh, the kind of role uh, and your take, particularly from AWS, and the overall purpose-centric ecosystems and how you see AWS driving uh, the capabilities there to, for sustainable growth. Your thoughts, Florian? Yeah, I think any such initiative should lead with one key objective. If we talk about ecosystems, purpose-centric, drive sustainable growth, they should do significantly accelerate cloud adoption at lower cost. That's our job. And significantly, I mean not 10 times, but maybe aiming at a factor of 100. And Jeff Bezos said, it's impossible to imagine a future 10 years from now where a customer comes up and says, I love Amazon. I just wish the prices were a little higher. Or I just wish you would deliver a little more slowly, right? Same for Gerard. Nobody will want to say in 10 years like, oh, I, I want the car a little later. Or uh, for Scott, I want, I want my room, I want to clean it myself. I want, to, I want to go a little later. So everything is always about something we can do that significantly changes the customer experience. In travel and hospitality, I believe we have a massive potential to do that. And that has to do with breaking out of legacy systems that have been in place for many, many years 
and modernize every mission critical workload as a cloud native microservice. And I want to give you a very practical example that is close to my heart. Um, the property management system and check-in as one of the most relevant guest facing services. Imagine um, for those that just started their journey that maybe not that mature as, as, as Scott is, but imagine to extract check-in from the PMS as a serverless function that runs natively in AWS Cloud. Now customers cannot just immediately benefit from cost efficiency and fast innovation. On top of that, they're able to measure the business ROI of their IT investment. And to make this even more practical, usage of Amazon Lambda in dollars per millisecond compared to the value of that specific guest transaction, input, output. This is where I see the ultimate goal, where we are able to literally transform with pre-built, purpose-built APIs, every business function into a microservice. And then you can scale it up and down. If you want remote check-in for a car, you can have it tomorrow. If you want to scale it down at a certain uh, car rental station, you shut it down, right? And you don't pay for it. And if you do it, you know what's happening. So this is where we believe is the chance to build scalable, pre-built APIs or integration that every partner can use because leaders like Scott and Gerard, they, they look at the industry and say, I, I, I want to test that new digital customer experience but uh, solution, but how does it fit into my infrastructure? We want to enable them to do that literally with a click. And that's where partners come in. We need partners that not just offer modern build applications, but someone like TCS, system integrator, integrators who can help to deploy those with domain expertise. Um, that's my, it's my take on it. Thank you, Floyd. And uh, as, you, as you said, uh, your example couldn't have been more apt in terms of the ability of investments to scale up and down. And, and the kind of investments are also ecosystemic in nature, right? They are not point in time capabilities, but helps to sort of scale it up. And that's exactly the point which Scott was talking about in terms of the operating model. And, and Gerard was uh, also telling about the fact that while you innovate for the future, you do have a certain amount of technical debt. So you've got to be mindful that you clear that out so that you have maximum agility while you move forward. So on that note, Jay, coming back to you, um, in terms of the world of cloud economics, Florian talked about it, right? In terms of the continuous innovation it brings. What is your take, uh, Jay, on how has the world of cloud economics evolved over the years? And if there was a piece of advice you would give to the audience in terms of how they should be looking at returns from the investment in cloud, right? What would that be, Jay? Yeah, so during the pandemic, we saw some incredible growth in the cloud, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud areas. We saw infrastructure as a service grow upwards of 50% quarter in and quarter out uh, in terms of year over year growth. We've seen SaaS, for example, grow at 30% in terms of quarter in and quarter out. So there's just been a huge opportunity given the last year and a half around, uh, around the cloud. One thing after about 20 years of cloud maturity is we're starting to understand the cloud economics, which I call the multiplier effect. For every dollar of cloud generates a lot of activity. And we know what those are now. You know, it's somewhere around $5 on average. Every company is slightly different, but almost two thirds of that $5 is services. The implementation, the integration, the security, the compliance, the data and automation, about uh, 20 percent of it is software and obviously there's additional hardware as well and internet of things and, and other things so when you look at the cloud economics in that way not only is it growing at 30 to 50 percent but every one of those growth dollars is also throwing out an additional five dollars of value creation co-innovation and network effects while everyone works together to pave that last mile for the customer Hey, thank you, Jay. That's very insightful and uh, it really summarizes uh, wonderful points which we have been discussing in the last hour or so. With that, uh, we'd conclude the panel conversation. Uh, Gerard, Scott and Florian, Jay, thank you. But before I let you go, by popular poll from the audience, we have a rapid fire question for all of you. So I, I would uh, go in an order of starting with you, Gerard. Give us three words which best describe value from the cloud. I would say scalability, automation, and agility. Scalability, automation, agility. Thank you, Gerard. 
Over to you, Scott. Three words. Elasticity, speed, and knowledge, with elasticity being the superpower. Right. Okay, we got superpower here. Elasticity, speed, and knowledge. Thank you. Florian, I know it's a bit of a trick question for you, but go ahead. From the perspective of an Amazonian with a with a builder mentality, I would say invent and simplify. Invent, simplify. You gotta give me one more word. Invent and simplify. <laughs> That's it. We simplify. You see? Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, Jay, over to you. Yeah, I would say number one is predictability. Number two is value creation. And number three is co-innovation. Wonderful, Jay. It's been a real pleasure having a wonderful energizing conversation with all of you gentlemen. Thank you, Gerard, Scott, Florian, Jay, for a very insightful presentation and for sharing your personal experiences of the cloud journeys and uh, how we see cloud transform ecosystems in the world of travel and hospitality. Thank you, everyone for being such a great audience. And if you have any questions or wish to meet with us, do reach out to us in the email ID mentioned here. Also request you to do, take a quick survey and share your feedback. Thank you and have a great day ahead.